everybody, Michelle here from Gardening TLC. I am so glad you're here today. It is gonna be a great video. We are gonna talk about island beds. So we're gonna cover shape, size, how you view it, balance, scale. Why would you even make a bed like this in your yard? Then we're gonna pick out some totally awesome plants and do a couple designs so you can see kind of how to put one together. So whether you're trying to create the illusion of a bigger yard or you're trying to create the illusion of more intimacy in your yard, we're gonna talk about that with island beds today. So come on, let's check it out. What's an island bed? Well, it's basically a freestanding garden that normally sits plunk in the middle of your lawn somewhere and it's surrounded by grass. You view it from all sides and you're really trying to accomplish something with an island bed when you make it. So it might be that you're trying to maybe make a really wide expanse of lawn seem a little bit smaller and shrinking it in and making it look a little more intimate to your house. It could also be that you have a really small yard and by putting an island in maybe further towards the road, it's going to make your yard look bigger. And so therefore you can do that. There's also the islands that you make that maybe create a privacy screen between you and your neighbor or you and something else. Or you can create an island because you're trying to block something that you just don't want to see. So there's a lot of different reasons to create island beds. Today, we're going to talk about some of the different things that I think you need to know to be able to create one that looks really pretty. I'll show you some pictures of designs that I've done over the years for island beds. Some were already there, some we created from scratch, and some we just revamped them because they needed uh, I guess a refresh because they just weren't quite structured properly. So let's jump right in. Now remember, when you put your island bed in, think about what is going on in the area that you're putting it in. Uh, is that where your kids play? Is that where foot traffic goes? So don't put your island beds there. You don't want to take away their play area and you don't want to create obstacles in your lawn that make your gardening harder. You want to actually do things that make your life easier. You also have to think of the concept Balance. Now, balance is a design term that we use that uh, talks about the visual weight of what it is that you're doing. And when you're doing an island, you want to have balance and visual weight that balances out everything else in your yard when you're making one. So if you have a high roof line on one side of your house and maybe the garage on the other so it's lower, or maybe you have a big tree on one side and nothing on the other, when you visually stand back and you look at your house, the visual weight is going to be where all the height is because the bigger something is, the more visual weight it carries. The same holds true with colors. The darker something is, the more visual weight a darker something has. Also, when you look at horizontal versus vertical things, something that's horizontal, like maybe a piece of flagstone or a piece of outcropping or something is going to have less visual weight than maybe a statue that is vertical. So that also will contribute to the visual weight of what it is that you're doing. So you want to have balance when you create the island. So it might be if you have all of your weight on one side of the house or the other, you want to scooch your island over so that you can put more visual weight on the other side. The other thing is, are you trying to make your lawn bigger or are you trying to make it look more intimate and Take a big long and make it look smaller. So you would bring it closer to the house or push it further away, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. All of that is your visual weight or your balance. The next part of designing your island bed is to determine what size does it need to be. So now we have to look at scale. I know we have to look at all of these things, but I have revamped so many island beds in my day because one of the things was off, either the balance, the scale, the size, where they put it, how they were viewing it and what they put in it that I thought it was important that I really cover these things because I think you have to think about these things. At the end of the day, just like every other homeowner out there, it's your garden and you can do whatever you want. My goal is to hopefully give you some tips and some information that will help you create something that is long lasting, low maintenance, beautiful to look at and serves a purpose in your garden for you to be able to create balance or scale or whatever it is you're trying to do. I do get a lot of questions about how do I make my yard look more intimate and smaller because I have so so much property. I get that question a so lot. The size of your house, the size of your lot, the size of the surrounding properties, they all play a part in scale. So you can make a really ginormous island in a little bitty yard and it overwhelms your yard. And the opposite is true where you make an itty bitty island in your yard that's ginormous 
and it just disappears. So the scale is important. So there are some design rules out there that I will tell you. I break these rules all the time. I don't really pay attention to them because at the end of the day, it's my house, my garden, and I'm going to do what I love and what I like. But basically, small houses and yards need small gardens. Big houses and big lawns need big gardens. They say one third of your property should be shrubs and flower beds and two thirds should be lawn. I don't know that I think that that's true in every case. I think that you can do whatever you want, but those are the rules that are out there if you want if you're that rule follower person, these are like the design principle rules that a lot of people follow. So you can get a lot of information out there as far as like how big your island bed should be. At the end of the day, it visually needs to be appealing. I like to follow a few guidelines though. One of them being that my island bed needs to be three times as long as it is wide. So if I have an island bed that is six to eight feet wide, I'm going to make sure that my bed is 18 to 24 inches long. That I find works pretty good, but a lot of times I'll make them wider than that just so I can have more depth in the bed. The other thing is when I'm doing an island bed, I will either weight all of my weight on one side and come down because I'm trying to create balance between heavier weight on the other side of the property or I'm going to put the weight in the middle and then I'm going to have medium and then small as I come out and as I come forward and that's how I'm going to do it that way. The biggest mistake that I've seen out there and pretty much all of the ones that I fixed, very rarely do I get one that's the right size. Most of the time they're too small. Another rule that people follow when they determine the size of what they want the bed to be is they will determine how big it's going to be or how wide it's going to be based on how far away it is from where they're actually viewing it. So if this is an island bed that's more close to the street, and let's say it's 10 feet away from the street, then it's usually better to make the bed half as wide as the distances from the street. So for example, if the bed is 20 feet away from the street, then maybe I want to make the bed 10 feet wide. The same thing holds true if it's viewed from the house, how far away is it from where you're viewing it? A lot of people will use that as their guideline for how wide to make it, but I still think no matter how wide you make it, you still need to have like three times the distance in length to make it balance well. So keep that in mind when you're making the island, especially if you have small property, you might not be able to make it that wide. You might have to be skinnier because your goal there is to try and make your stuff look bigger, not smaller. Next is choosing the shape. So you can have a formal island out there that's going to have angular corners, or you can have an informal that's going to have free-flowing curves. Ovals and kidney shapes are great for this. Now remember, when you're doing curves in an island bed, don't do little horseshoe curves like this. That's really hard to mow, and visually it doesn't look good. Long, sweeping curves looks way better than you could ever do in these little horseshoe curves. The other thing is, remember, in nature there are no straight lines, so I like to use curves when I'm doing an island bed. It makes it look a little more informal. It also gives me the option of making it wider at one end, skinnier at the other, mirrored out, balanced, whatever it is that I'm going for. Choose a shape that pleases you. Get out there with your paint. Draw some shapes. What does it look like? What do you like? It's your garden. So when it comes to shape, I think that there are so many possibilities. I think it comes right down to pick the shape you like. This is an example of a really large island that was shaped like an oval. So we were given this project probably four years ago. We created a design for this and we actually put it in. So let me take you through kind of my thought process and following some of the design principles that we just talked about of what we're doing in this bed. Now, because this is such a large bed, I started with taller things in the middle and I'm getting smaller as I move to the outside edge of the bed. There wasn't really any need to create visual weight on one side or the other because this whole property is surrounded by large spruce trees. It's a ranch style house, so I didn't have to really create that. So we wanted to create something that was really beautiful that they could see from either side. So as we design this, you'll see that what we put on the front side of this is what you see on the back side of it as well. So no matter how you're viewing it all the way around, it's beautiful. All right, we decided to leave the bed in an oval. It was 50 feet long and 15 feet wide. So if I want the bed to be three times as wide as it is long, that would be 15 times three. Guess what? That's 45, the bed's 50, we're close enough. So we cleaned up the edges, we installed the outcropping because it was such a long bed, we wanted to have something to break up the areas. And then we decided to use a Skyrocket Juniper in the center. 
I like the skyrockets because they're really easy to grow. They're drought tolerant once they get established. They are skinny. They're probably one of the skinnier, if not the skinniest juniper that you can find out there, only growing two to three feet wide because I didn't want to take up the whole center of the bed with my evergreen that I was going to use. So I had winter interest. I had my height in the middle and it was easy to grow because they don't require any pruning whatsoever. So your rule of thumb as far as how high something should be in a bed like this is you want it to be about one and a half times high as it is wide. So if the bed was 15 feet wide and I multiply that by one and a half, guess what that is? 22 feet. These guys grow anywhere from 18 to 25 feet tall. Check, that one works and it's great. And I like to do it where the junipers are three different sizes so that when they're growing, they have staggered heights. Now in 20 years, they'll all be the same height, but while they're growing, it looks so cool. So I would probably buy a four foot one, a six foot one and an eight foot one because the distance between them, two feet, that really looks good visually. And it's a little easier on the pocketbook than buying three eight foot ones. So I love this start of what we're doing in this island bed. Now we also chose boxwoods for this bed because we needed them to grow in both sun and shade because the left part of the bed gets more shade, the right part of the bed gets more sun. And so I chose the boxwoods and I did the winter gems. They're very consistent when they grow. They grow about three by three and they're really super pretty. They're green, they're winter hardy, they're drought tolerant once you get them established and they'll grow in both sun and shade. And we did other landscaping at this house. So we used boxwoods in other places. And it was one of the plants that we used to tie into the other beds. And so that's a design concept that you can use as well is use some of the plants that you have in other parts of your landscaping that you can see from the island to tie the two together. That way, visually, things look like they go together and they're flowing throughout everything that you're doing. So we put three on each side. We have them on the back side of the outcropping and we did them in a V pattern. So we put the boxwoods in and I think that this was a great winter interest throughout the whole bed. And as you can see, we're getting smaller, but we're still big enough and we're still kind of in the center part of the bed. I chose the Invincible Mini Mauvettes by Proven Winners because I think these things were the perfect flowering shrub to put in here. These guys bloom on new wood. So even if you hack the heck out of them, they will come back every year and bloom year after year. They are fabulous in cold climates. They grow in zone four through eight and they will come back every single year. They're pretty dependable. They'll grow in part shade or sun. And I love that about them. They're pretty adaptable. They have a beautiful white flower when they come out and then they age to this mauvey pink that continues to get darker and darker and darker as it progresses through the season. The mop heads on here dry really super well. You can cut them when they're in color or you can cut them as they start to turn that brown color, which most smooth hydrangeas will do. You can leave the flowers on through the winter and give them a haircut in the spring. You can cut them to the ground. Doesn't really matter. If you screw it up, they'll come back. They are super easy to grow. And I think they are the perfect color in this bed for long bloom flower power. And not only are there three on this side, there's three on the other side of those tall junipers. And then we planted two in the little V pockets that we made with the boxwoods. So all together, there was six, eight, eight of these in there. And did I say zone four through eight, they grow three and a half to four feet tall and wide. So a great partner plant with those boxwoods. And the last thing that we put in the bed that we mirrored on the other side as well is we chose purple Veronica to put in here and you could put whatever color scheme that you want, whatever Veronica you want. We liked them because they get low. We like them because it has pretty foliage. We like them because they're long blooming. We like them because they grow in part shade or part sun. So you could choose whatever Veronica you like. In this one, we chose Royal Candles and I really like that one. We also chose some Stella de Oro Daylilies because we wanted a yellow element in here. We also wanted something that was easy to grow, was a repeat bloomer. And so those are on opposite sides as well. And then in the front, we did this little more grass because all of the plants that we chose kind of have the same growing conditions. And as you can see, we did drifts of the same things and repeated patterns throughout so that you've got this nice cohesive bed that flows throughout. I just think this thing turned out so gorgeous. A lot of times as a landscaper, you get what you get. And so this was an island bed that was already there. They already had the tree planted and it wasn't quite in the right spot. It was a little small for what they were trying to accomplish. And that was 
They wanted an island bed that made their yard look a little bit bigger, but the whole thing probably should have been scooted over like 15 to 20 feet, uh, but they didn't want to move it. So we had to leave it right where it was. And sometimes, you know what, you buy a house or you do something and you've spent time growing things and you just don't want to take them out. So you got to do what you got to do with what you have. And that's what we did in the case of this bed. And that might be a situation that you have. Not everything is start from scratch blank slate. As a landscape designer, that was pretty rare that we got that. Most of the time we had to figure out what to do with what was already there. So with this one, what we did was I circled the limb right there. I cut that big side limb that was coming out from the tree out to give it more of a nice, pretty vase shape. And then we inner pruned all the crossing branches. We opened it up. We took all the bottom limbs off and we made the bed a little bit bigger because it just wasn't proportionate to the tree and what it was that we were going to do. So in this case, all the weights on the right side and that's why I think it needed to be scooted over so that that weight wasn't in front of their house. It was over further to create balance. And that's what balance means now, because we had to leave it here. That's why we pruned it down. And then let me show you what we did. Those of you have, that have been watching me for a while, have you figured out yet that I really like rocks and outcropping? I use them a lot in my designs because they really do create a nice focal piece and you can create little vignettes of whatever you're doing around it. Now we actually made this bed a little bit bigger and we did an oval in this one as well. Now in this picture, you can still see the limb and everything there, but we did prune those out. We ended up putting three bird's nest spruce in here. So right here, one, two, and then there's one on the other side of the baptisia that's in the center. Then we used a taller center plant, which is the Baptisia. We put black eyed Susans. We have some coral bells down on the other end because it's shaded. We used some Dianthus in the front. And then there's some on the other side as well, because guess what? It's a mirrored bed that goes all the way around. The biggest difference between this one and the one that we just did is the visual weight is over here on the right, but we still kind of went taller in the center and then came down on the other side. And then we have a purple, pretty, uh, short salvia called Marcus in the front. So this one here, super easy to grow. They all have the same growing requirements. Now, this picture shows everything in bloom all at the same time, but it doesn't all bloom at the same time. The dianthus are going to bloom first. Then, oh, I forgot. There's some little coreopsis right there. See, I circled those. There's coreopsis in here. There's salvia. So it's going to have a succession of blooms as we go through the season, but it was still a pretty low maintenance bed. And in the end, it really beautified the front of their house. This next one we did from scratch. And so they had a really super long front yard and then it sloped right down into a drainage ditch. On the right side of the driveway, they had a really big oak tree. So they had a lot of weight on the right side of their house and we needed to create a little bit of weight on the left side. And we wanted to create a little bit of privacy and intimacy by creating an island bed that would block off some of the view of the front of the house. Now, where you see those little things sticking out of the ground right there, those are the neighbor's property. So their property line was maybe 10 feet out from the corner of the house. And so we did the island almost to the edge of the property to give them that visual block but also to kind of make this front yard seem a little smaller and a little more intimate. So we already knew where we were putting it more towards the road that was going to be our view area. So to figure out how big we wanted to make it, we measured how far from the road was it going to be set back. And so it was 15 feet from the road and we want the bed to be about half as wide as the distance it is away from your main viewing area. That meant seven and a half feet. So we just made the bed eight feet wide. And then we want the bed to be three times as long as it is wide. So eight times three, we made it 24 feet long. And then we did our little kidney shape. So that's how we determined the size. And then they liked the kidney and that determined the shape. Now we are putting the weight of this on the left side because we're trying to create balance with the stuff that's on the right side, which is the big oak tree. They wanted a flowering crab tree and we chose a prairie fire crab. This thing is absolutely gorgeous. It gets these beautiful fuchsia pink flowers on it in the spring. And then it gets these green leaves behind the flowers, but they kind of have a little bit of an eggplant purple on the underside of the leaves. And when they are moving in the wind, they are gorgeous. This thing 
thing is a beautiful, beautiful tree. Now, the one thing with crab apples that I find that's the biggest nuisance, and we did talk about this with the homeowner, is they grow suckers on the bottom of them that come up at the base. And so you have to get out there and prune those out to keep your tree cleaned up. And so he knows that he has to do that. But just in case you didn't know that, crabs do do that. You'll also see that I put two boulders in the bed because again, I think they're cool. They add visual interest and I like them. So that's what we did first. Next, I added my evergreens because I want to make sure I have winter interest. I decided to use a bird's nest spruce over on the right side. It's kind of got a flat top, but you don't have to prune them. And they are this beautiful bright green color when the new foliage comes out in the spring. And then they darken to a darker green as we progress further into summer. And they're easy to grow. They're drought tolerant. They'll handle the full sun out there. And it's going to give me a nice winter anchor. The other thing I put in the bed was my blue. And I want to use the little junipers, the blue star junipers. These are the cutest little things. They are these little bitty round ones. They kind of grow low to the ground. They have different shapes as they grow depending on the plant. They don't all grow like the same. So I like this one, a nice blue element and they're little. So we're going to tuck three of these in around the boulder so that we don't hide the boulders, but it's going to give me winter stuff for winter. Now, I picked a firelight tidbit to put in this bed. It is a hydrangea by Proven Winners, and it is a paniculata, which means it can grow in full sun. It does bloom on new wood, but what you want to do is only take a third of the plant off in the spring when the buds are starting to swell because you want to get a nice structure and a nice base on the bottom of this shrub. Now, I'm not doing the mirror effect on this island bed because it's so far away from the house. When you're looking out the window, you're not going to really see the details of the perennials that we're going to put in this in the front of the bed, but I still want something to be really beautiful that you're going to view out the window. That's why I'm putting the hydrangeas in. They have a seriously long bloom time, and when these guys bloom, the tidbits, the firelights, Oh my gosh, they practically obscure all of the leaves on this shrub because they get so many flowers and they start white and then they age to pink. And then that pink starts to get like reds in it. And it's just absolutely fabulous. I love this. Only gets like two and a half to three feet tall and wide. So it's not going to overtake the bed or be misproportioned to the size of the bed that we're doing. And I think they're perfect. Last but not least, we're going to add some perennials to the bed over on the left kind of behind the tree, we have what we call Korean feather reed grass. This is a calamagratus. This is a great grass, grows in both sun or shade. It's what we call a medium sized grass. The actual grass itself gets 18 to 24 inches tall, and then it gets the plumes above it in August, which come out like a champagne pink. I use a lot in design, and I really like it, and it's a really pretty background grass to give you some movement in there. In front of that, we have some alliums. These are the summer blooming alliums, whether you use millennium, serendipity. I just like alliums. The foliage when it comes up in the spring always looks really good. It looks good when it gets its little billy balls on it, when they bloom purple, when they're done. I mean, it's just a nice, tidy looking plant all the time. And it's a great pollinator attractor if you're trying to bring some of those into the yard great plant to choose from. Then all the way to the right, we needed another easy care plant. So again, I chose a Stella de Oro. This is a daylily. It's a repeat bloomer. And I did it on the edge of the bed. And he knows that if the foliage ever starts to look icky, he can just cut it down. It'll grow new foliage and look good the rest of the year. So this is the garden bed that we designed, the island for them. And I think it's perfect. It's the perfect size and it creates beauty and balance and just what they needed. Remember I said you get what you get? Well, this was what we started with. And they wanted to create a privacy barrier island between their property and the neighbor's property. And that's what we did. The first thing we did was we took everything out. And then we cut a long straight line, probably four or five feet away from the edge of the property line. And that was the back of the bed. And then we did a long sweeping arcing curve and then just did straight lines on the edge to create the bed. Now, even though this is kind of a privacy screen and it's only really going to be viewed from one side, it's still an island because it still sits plunk in the middle of the yard and it doesn't have anything anchoring it. The biggest difference with this is we want to make it so that what they're viewing is beautiful. Now you can certainly make what your neighbors is viewing beautiful too, but most people when they're doing this, they just want that screen there 
to create privacy and intimacy in their own yard. Now we chose to do a line of junipers to create our privacy barrier between the properties because junipers here are easier to grow. A lot of people will use arbovitas, but just know arbovitas sometimes aren't drought tolerant and they don't have as wide of a growing conditions as a juniper does, but a lot of people don't like junipers. So you have to pick what you like here. And also you can find junipers that grow two feet wide. You can find junipers that grow eight to 10 feet wide. And so you just kind of have to find the one that fits your unique situation and what it is that you're trying to do. Now, the other thing when I'm gonna do junipers like this to create like a privacy barrier, I'm gonna plant one forward, one back, one forward, one back. That's going to allow me to plant them a little bit closer together because if I plant them in a straight line all the way across, I have to space them enough that they have room to grow and then you have gaps. And I'm trying to eliminate the gaps as quickly as possible. Now, the one thing is it's gonna cost you more money to go back and forth every other way because it's gonna take more junipers or arborvitas or whatever you use to do that. But junipers also grow faster than arborvitas. A lot of them are pretty fast growers. So that would be the other reason I would choose the juniper because it's going to be easier on my pocketbook if I have to start with shorter ones. I will use a mass planting of one kind of shrub in front of the junipers. Typically when you're planting a island like this and it's a barrier between you and another property, it's usually a good distance away from your house. So to have impact, I wanna have a big drift of one thing that I can visually see that's gonna give me a lot of weight. The reason is if I'm doing a bunch of little delicate things, I can't even see that but I still want it to be pretty and I still want it to be beautiful. So I'm gonna use something that's inexpensive, but impactful. So I might use something like what I've got going on here. This would be an incredible, and this is the white. It's a smooth hydrangea. It'll grow in full sun or part sun. If you're further south, full sun might not be the greatest for these, but if you have a part shade situation, or maybe these arborvitas are gonna cast shade on this because maybe they are on the I don't know west side of your property, then that will be an ideal situation for something like this. Or you can choose a different shrub. So maybe you spent your budget on trees because you wanted to start with bigger trees and you need to have a shrub in front of it that's a little less expensive. A spirea is a really good way to go. And I'm not talking about some of these old spireas that get rangy and icky. They have come a long ways in spireas. And I really like the double play series from Proven Winners. They have a double play gold, they have a pink, they have a red. So you can pick the color scheme that you like. This here is the double play pink. They get about three by three and they have serious blooming power and they will keep blooming all summer long. They're sterile and they don't go all over the place. And your maintenance on a spirea is you prune it back pretty much to a big basketball once a year and that's it. So super easy to grow, drought tolerant, full sun, light shade, but these would look great because they give you that beautiful impact because when it gets new foliage before they're flowering, they still look good. If you wanted to stop with just the junipers and the arborvitas and then a row of shrubs in front of it, stop right there. I like to have a third layer in front of that. And so in the center, I've planted a slow mound moogle pine. And then on either side of that, I have red drift roses. Now you wouldn't have to do this if you don't want to, but if you want to create another layer, you're basically just starting at tall and you're working your way down to shorter and shorter layers until you get to the front. You could put perennials too as your third layer. And I've done little piglet grasses on either end, followed by nepeta as we come towards the center and then another slow mound moogle pine. Now, whatever it is that you choose to do, make sure you can see it, it's worth it. And two, can you get water to it to keep it watered? Now, everything that I chose to put out here is pretty drought tolerant once you get it established. Like any new bed, you have to water it to keep it to stay in. Now, you might not want to use perennials. Part of it will be how far away is it? Are you going to see it? Or is it just a functional bed that you're trying to create a privacy screen? And maybe you stop again at just the junipers and then the row of shrubs. I hope you guys learned something today. Had a good time with me as we talked about island designs and just fun tips and techniques that you can use to create an island in your yard. I hope that you're just chomping at the bit to run outside, sharpen your shovel, go outside and plant something in the ground. I know I am. In the last four days, we have had 
Temperatures in the teens, six inches of snow, rain, cold, no sun. It has been no fun. I have not even started my cleanup yet because the weather can't make up its mind if it wants to be spring or winter. And that's what it's like here in Northern Illinois, Zone 5B. So come along with me as we keep gardening through the season. It's going to warm up next week and we're going to start our series on vegetable gardening and herbs. That will be every Monday. So make sure you come along on that journey with us and plants will start to arrive in the greenhouse here within the next two weeks. And I can't wait to see some of the color that we're bringing in. All of you guys that have been coming to the garden center to say, hey, I love it when you come and I feel so horrible when I'm not there. So drop me a line and let me know you're coming because I'll make sure that I'm there. I am Michelle. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. I will see you in the next video. Keep on gardening. Bye.